Great. Uh, I'm Bob Walker. I'm the project manager for the Maglev Project at Gemstone. With me on the stage today is Alan Otis, uh, principal engineer. And um, we're going to go kind of in reverse order to the, the folks that were just before us. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, status and then turn it over to Alan for you know, much more technical dialogue. Um, you know, I've been thinking recently about the evolution of object-oriented languages uh, that's taken place over the last couple of decades. And it started dawning on me that there's really been no analogous evolution in storage mechanisms. You know, it, it's in 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you'd be writing your code in procedural languages and you'd be writing to read data from you know, a tape or a vSAM file or a relational database into a flat, basically explicitly defined record layout where you had to define, you know, every single type, every single length, you know, count all the bytes and it all had to fit in that place. Well, quite a long time has passed and we are still doing that with our objects. You know, the tabular schema of the relational database fit merged quite nicely with the, uh, the idea of you know, explicitly defined areas of memory. It's a really pretty easy mapping. But as object-oriented uh, software has evolved, um, it's, it just doesn't quite fit anymore. You, know, you need to go get the state from the relational database and assemble your objects out of it and uh, if something's changed and it needs to be written back to the database, well, you've got to kind of deconstruct that and push it back to the database. Um, and what has that led to? Well, that's led to mapping frameworks. And mapping frameworks have been around probably as long as uh, object-oriented programming has been around. And, you know, there are plenty of them. There are some very popular ones today that do the job, you know, fairly effectively from what I understand. Uh, although, you know, mapping frameworks don't come without issues. There's, there's a whole spectrum of them. You, there's code complexity somewhere. There's additional CPU overhead as a result of the mapping that has to be done. There are constraints of having to force fit your object graph into fundamentally a tabular structure. Uh, and there are issues around translating relational associations into object aggregations. I mean, there, there's a whole litany of these things. Now, no matter how deeply hidden or pushed down in a mapping framework the or actual mapping mechanisms are, there's still a fundamental mismatch between the object model and the relational schema. It's still there and it impacts the way that you think about designing your classes, the way you design your applications. No way around it. So why do we continue down this road? Well, for one, uh, there's a lot of relational data out there and the need for mapping to and from it isn't gonna go away anytime soon, right? I, once, somebody once told to me, uh, data sticks where it's thrown. So it's the truth. Um, but what if you could use a pure persistence by reachability model instead? and do away with any need at all to flatten out your Ruby instances and stick them away in a database. You know, just dispense with the mapping layer completely. You can if you use Maglev. Maglev gives Ruby the ability to transparently cache and store potentially huge complex graphs of objects without the constraints of OR mapping. In Maglev, your classes define your model, pure and simple. The model is the schema of the application. No need to you know, create any kind of um, NRE mappings of any kind. You just don't have to do that. You don't have to define uh, cardinalities, associations. Um, you don't have to think about that ever. You know, unless, of course, uh, you, you, well, jumping ahead on a point. What this gives you is less complexity, less code you have to maintain, and it gives you the freedom to think in a purely object modeling frame 
of mind without having to pay any attention whatsoever to, you know, is this really going to map well into my relational database? And for, you know, for, for relatively small object models, no problem. If you get into something that's hugely complex graph of objects, uh, that's where the mapping into a relational database really starts to become painful when you start having to, you know, custom uh, write, you know, outer joins and this sort of thing to reconstitute your object graph. So with maglev, you can continue to use your object relational mapping frameworks to access legacy data. It's not required. You know, of course, we understand in a heterogeneous world of data, um, there's going to be a lot of places you might get your data from. You might do a W get. You might look it up from an old vSAM file. You know, who knows? Um, now, part of our vision, of course, is that anything written in Ruby will run on maglev, and that includes your mapping frameworks. Now, if they include C, it might be a little bit longer, uh, but we're working on that. And you'll be able to use, access your relational databases from a maglev application, just as you would uh, in any Ruby application. So that's kind of my spiel on OR mapping and maglev. Um, I want to move into giving you a status of where we are today. Uh, we've made a lot of progress since we last spoke to the community at large. Um, the persistence uh, of Ruby objects is working very, very well. You know, it should. The underlying technology uh, has had it working well for, for quite some time. Um, We've been mostly focused over the last three months on getting the kernel uh, and core libraries implemented and implemented correctly because we really feel that uh, um, if we have that done right, uh, the standard library will really start to fall into place. Now, I'm sure there will be issues along the way. Uh, but nonetheless, that's, that's the approach we're taking. Uh, we've also been doing a lot of work, Alan has, in particular has been doing a lot of work on making sure the virtual machine and the bytecodes are correct uh, and that we're parsing and compiling uh, uh, bytecodes that are executing you know, by the, the, uh, the criteria of, of the Ruby specifications. Um, micro benchmark execution time remains stable. Uh, we certainly haven't lost any ground on the micro benchmarks. We're, we're in some cases a little bit faster than we were, say, four or six months ago. Um, these are due to optimizations that are being made, you know, the low-hanging fruit along the way. Um, we haven't sat down and done a thorough performance optimization pass, you know, which is just not the right time in the development cycle to do that. Uh, there are still a number of unknowns in front of us, and we will do that at, at some point. Um, we are starting on the standard library. Um, and as I said earlier, if we feel, it, we feel that we've got the core library implementation done right, uh, a lot of the standard library should just run, theoretically. We'll find out. Uh, how are we going to know if it's done right? Well, Ruby spec, right? Ruby spec tests are going to tell us if we're behaving the way we should, if we're erroring out, or if we're failing some of the specs. And we've been running those uh, really continuously. And um, back in August, uh, I started tracking uh, our progress on this. And the one and only slide that I have here is, uh, you said the down, page down key, is this one. Now, re remember, these are uh, uh, the core and language. We haven't started on library yet. So back in August, this is where we were. We were passing 1,809, you know. It was an achievement at the time. It was great. 1,809 of the expectations, uh, a, n a number of them erroring out um, because we're still getting our error, error uh, we're still starting to throw the right errors in the right places. Um, you know, some of them were bubbling up out of the underlying technology and uh, coming out as something different than what the spec would expect. Uh, but the specs have been tremendously useful in guiding us uh, to where we need to do things. In September, you can see we took a pretty good jump up in terms of what we're passing. Uh, in October, you know, yet again, a pretty good jump. And the goal is, you know, there's something like 15,800 and change 
uh, expectations, I think currently, um, in the, the core and the uh, language suite. Um, and it's not that we are failing to run those, it's that what we are running against is a more outdated version that, than what's current up on the RubySpec project. Um, one of the key things we'll be working on as soon as we get back next week uh, is, is taking care of that so that we've got you know, the current version of MSpec and the current versions of RubySpecs running. Right. Um, now, uh, next slide. So we're not there yet, of course, uh, but we've made, I think, tremendous progress in the kernel and the core implementation. Uh, we're continue, continuing in that direction. We're totally committed to uh, adhering to the specs and uh, you know, hope to start feeding into that process uh, as, as our core and kernel stuff gets more mature. Now, over the next few months, we'll be completing the core libraries and filling out the standard libraries. Uh, we've got a design effort underway to determine what the usage model for the persistent domains should look like to a, a Ruby programmer. Uh, and we are you know, soliciting opinions from a lot of different people. Um, um, and I'd be really interested in hearing your thoughts on what you would expect from uh, a Ruby object persistence. Basically, the way it works uh, right now is you can uh, bind any kind of object into a class variable, let's say, a collection of some kind, and you can stick all your instances in there, and anything that they can reach will be per persisted in the repository by reachability. You go in and dereference one of those guys and you commit it, it's garbage. It's really pretty simple. Let's see, uh, we, have, uh, we need to start adding in support for deployment and migrations and you know, tools for, for use uh, of the product. So you know, we still have a ways to go. Um, the, the news today um, that I'd like to deliver is that we are very close to having an early alpha release. Uh, and um, we are going to give it to you know, a fairly small group of people uh, who are A, interested in, and, you know, B, kind of have some insight into what we're doing. Uh, we'd like to give it out to everybody, but, you know, our, our bandwidth is kind of limited. If we did that, you know, we'd be so overwhelmed by responding to everybody that, that uh, uh, it would be kind of hard to, to get our regular work done. Um, however, there will, as we go forward uh, and start to widen the scope of access to this, we'll widen, we'll open up an alpha release uh, to a much broader audience. We'll open up a beta release to an even larger audience. Uh, and you know, somewhere in that time frame, we'll have all of the Ruby sources available you know, for uh, checkout uh, via a Git repository. And um, we will need to work out how you know, we feed that back into our, our own processes. Um, um, but you know, once this is out there, you'll be able to uh, code in in the Ruby code that we've written, um, the Ruby code that we've borrowed, uh, the Smalltalk code. If you care to dig into that, um, it'll all be there where, where you'll be able to see it. Um, I think I've already gone over time, so let me let me close out by saying there's still uh, a, a couple of other things. We we uh, we're going to start soon establishing a channel for communication with community. We've been so focused on just sort of getting this thing ramped up uh, that we haven't been able to pay a lot of t attention to that. Um, and we have a lot of work to do around things like Ruby gems and Rails. I mean, that's still a ways off. Uh, but you know, fundamentally, we're focusing on the core language and getting the language uh, uh, and the libraries uh, impl implemented and in such a way that you can you know, use Ruby object persistence you know, outside of the Rails environment. Um, Rails will take a little bit longer. Anyway, um, with that, uh, I think I've gone over my time, so I'd like to introduce Alan, our principal engineer, and thank you all very much. So is this working okay? I hope, the microphone. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about uh, Maglev's execution technology. Um, as you may know, we started with our with Gemstone's mature Smalltalk product, which includes both a Smalltalk VM and object persistence. 
And we've taken the strategy of compiling Smalltalk to, or compiling Ruby to Smalltalk bytecodes and adding new bytecodes as needed. And we, we're reusing quite a bit of the Smalltalk class library, but in a controlled way so that unless it's explicitly coded in a kernel method that you're transitioning from Ruby to Smalltalk, you won't actually inherit all the Smalltalk methods automatically. Um, so what does object persistence look like? Um, we have a, 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 a maglev VM here, and you can have many VMs on a given uh, repository. We consider the disk objects to be the repository. And there's a shared memory cache uh, so that multiple VMs can uh, share you know, disk IOs, basically. Uh, and what does that mean to the programmer? Uh, basically, the very simplest model you might have for persistence use case would be to have a top level instance of hash, which is persistent, which is actually the way the small talk persistence looks. There's a very top level hash, which has a res reserved object identifier to always keep it alive. And that's committed when the database is initially built. And then you can add objects to that hash. And if you say commit, the objects reachable from your new, you know, added entries will become persistent. So if you were to access some element of that hash, the objects on disk would get brought into the shared memory cache if, they, if the disk pages would get brought in if they weren't already in. And then the, di the objects would be copied out of disk pages selectively into uh, the object memory. So this is a copy on read design so that a persistent object will be in memory where it can have a memory address and look very similar to a temporary object. Uh, so then if you create some new objects and make some of them reachable from your persistent objects, the objects you modify over in the persistent area will be put in a dirty list for you automatically by the VM. And those dirty objects will be transitively closed to basically make the new objects also go to disk. And that's sort of how the object persistence works. Um, now, the rest of the talk is mostly going to be about the execution technology. And uh, so fundamentally, we're getting our speed from the mature Smalltalk VM. And what makes a Smalltalk VM fast is that it's basically executing very simple bytecode operations. And those are simple enough that you can make them fast. So, the return from method bytecode, for example, uh, assuming you're running with our native code generator, is four machine instructions. The message send, if you're coming through a part of a message where you've, a part of a method where you've executed once before, and so the cache for that send has been loaded, a message send with a first level cache hit is 20 machine instructions. Now that send is, after you've already pushed the receiver and arguments. It's a stack-based machine. So you've pushed the receiver and arguments, and then the actual send bytecode is what gets you 20 machine instructions. So 20 mach machine instructions then get you to the first instruction in the method that you're invoking. Uh, we're also trying to keep memory footprint small. We have a, a good compact and garbage collector, and we're trying to minimize the number and size of objects and make the bytecodes match the language. Now, how does Ruby compare to Smalltalk to, for someone who's you know, a VM implementer? Well, there are qu fortunately quite a few similarities. We there's no strict typing in either language. There's the dynamic message lookup. Uh, you can add and remove methods to a class dynamically. Um, strings and arrays are variable size objects. Uh, the gemstone dialect of Smalltalk has strings and arrays directly variable sized. Uh, they're both essentially single inheritance uh, as opposed to C++. They have exception handling, uh, blocks, and fairly similar base classes. Now, what are some of the differences? Probably the biggest difference is Ruby has variable number of method arguments, whereas Smalltalk, uh, each method declares a fixed number of arguments. Um, there are keywords like break, next, redo, and retry, and Smalltalk doesn't believe in the notion of a go-to. Uh, now, Smalltalk does, does support return from inside of a method or block that 
returns from the home context. So that's similar still. Uh, Ruby has the, the notion of the super keyword, but it's somewhat restricted, whereas in Smalltalk, super is, very, is basically the same as self, except for where the lookup starts. Um, that was kind of a surprise to a Smalltalk programmer like myself, the difference there. Uh, Ruby has uh, modules, and Smalltalk is more just a straight inheritance hierarchy. Um, and Ruby has what we think, what we call dynamic instance variables, whereas Smalltalk, the instance variables are fixed at the time a class is defined. And we'll talk a bit about how we deal with that. Um, Smalltalk has um, behavior as a common superclass of both class and meta class, and all three of these are, you know, first class access to the programmer. And Ruby only has class, um, so we've had to do some work in that area. Now, what do I mean by Smalltalk uh, Super uh, being different? Uh, well, this is an example of a class ENV, uh, and we're using an instance of this ENV class to implement the global object uppercase ENV. So we decided to just make it a subclass of hash since it's supposed to basically have a hash-like protocol. So I did this, and then I went off to implement basically the instance of lowercase env is going to have as its elements a cache of all of the uh, elements from the program's environment. So if you say at colon, I want to first look in the cached values, and if it's not there, do a get env call to the operating system to see if maybe it is there, and then refresh the cache. And so to accomplish that, this is small talk code here, I do a super at, which says look in this instance of env using the square bracket accessor essentially. If it's not there, then do the uh, operating system call, and this is a small talk primitive method here. If I got something non-nil, return that. Otherwise, I'm going to update the receiver of this at colon, and what I want to do is send at put to super but you can't really do that in Ruby, so I had to write this method in Smalltalk. Now what about our compilation uh, technology? Currently for the alpha release and prior to this point, we've been using an MRI 1.8.6 VM running as a, uh, a parse server process, and we're using the parse tree gem, and so over an HTTP connection, we request the file to be compiled and get back a string containing all the S expressions. And that then gets, comes into the maglev VM, um, and we'll talk about what happens next. So in the maglev VM, we uh, send an HTTP request to the MRI VM specifying a path to this, our Ruby file, or possibly a string for an evaluation. We get back the S expressions. That goes through a small talk uh, S expressions parser stage, which produces a tree of an AST tree in small talk object memory. We then go through some more small talk code, which produces an IR tree. And this IR tree is the same tree that is produced by our small talk parser. Um, the small talk parser is actually written in C, which is how we bootstrap the whole system. And then uh, we have a bytecode generator written in C that generates instances of this GSN method class, which is our small talk compiled method class. And then um, on demand, we can turn those GSN methods into machine code with a very simple native code generator. So what does the uh, bytecode generator, which is this, uh, this, this stage here, what does it do? It's, uh, it's doing some very simple bytecode optimizations uh, based on the stack machine concept. You know, if you're pushing the same, <coughs> we're trying to take push pop or pop push sequences and convert them to store loads to reduce uh, memory references, removing branch indirections, deleting unreachable code. We take method and block temporaries from wherever they're declared and move them to the innermost block possible to reduce up-level accesses. And we delete some unreferenced temporaries. So all the decisions about where a method temporary is going to live are done here. And we'll 
get to these variable context things in a minute. Uh, so we have two execution modes in our VM. There's an interpreted mode, which is executing bytecodes using a hand-coded assembly language interpreter. Uh, we actually write our interpreters in M4 for partial portability, so it's not too hard to uh, you know, move them between CPUs. And uh, as it turns out, you're only using a very small percentage of the real assembly language instruction set for a stack machine, maybe you know, 10 or 15 percent. Uh, and the, the interpreter supports both breakpointing and single stepping for the purposes of debuggers. Our native code system, uh, so an execution is either all in interpreted mode or all in native code. We don't do mixed mode execution. So the native code would be generated on demand the first time a method is invoked. Um, so what do we do with the native code? We, translate each bytecode to machine code, and it's a very simple code generator, no inlining, and it has a one register stop, top of cache uh, state machine. Complicated bytecodes would be jumping to uh, shared code that uh, we call stubs that are emitted when the native code generator is initialized, or they may call into C uh, primitives written in C within the VM. The native code gets us two to three times improvement over the interpreter. Uh, you know, it's not a tremendous amount, and, and like I said, we're not doing any fancy inlining or anything, but the main message here is that for Ruby, people building new Ruby VMs, it's not strictly necessary to have native code to get pretty decent performance if you get the byte codes right. So what does a message send uh, look like? Uh, as I mentioned, Smalltalk has fixed arguments to each message send, and we want to try to keep it that way for performance. So except for a call or yield sent to a block, all of our Ruby message sends are actually fixed number of arguments. Um, so for example, in a Smalltalk, if you're sending at put to an object, then you're looking during the method lookup for the symbol at put. And because of the way Smalltalk selectors or message method names are work, you know, there's no ambiguity, ambiguity about how many uh, arguments there are. So the, mes the method lookup infrastructure in the VM can just do an identity compare on symbols to figure out if it's got the right key in a method dictionary. That also makes the method, the caches for the method lookup very easy to implement because you really only need, you know, two words, a symbol that, or, or you know, really you only need a, it's, you know, in a lot of the caches, you only need one word for the key, which is the symbol. Uh, so how do we do with the Ruby variable number of arguments? Well, we have what are called bridge methods. And we started off a while back, and we did an analysis of the Smalltalk Seaside web framework and discovered that 98% of the methods in that framework have three or fewer arguments. 95% have two or less. So we're compiling all... Uh, Ruby message sends to conform to a maximum message, message signature of three fixed arguments, an array, and an optional block, which gets you like 16 possible variations. And yes, that may cause a lot of extra methods to be generated, but first of all, most of them are very small. And in our system, the unused methods can live on disk where they won't occupy memory in production. Um, so what does a Ruby message send look like? So here we have a class which is defining a store method. Uh, and that store method will have as its signature colon star. So we create an instance of that class. And then uh, this is, and then we want to call store with one argument. This store will have the signature store colon. And so at runtime, that will resolve to the store colon bridge method, which will push the first argument on the stack, push a nil to match the required second argument, and then invoke the actual store method. Um, so here's a, a three argument invocation. So the bridge method there will throw away the third argument and then invoke the actual method. And uh, if we create an array, and then invoke that, the bridge method for stores star will uh, 
take the first element out of that array and pass it to the declared argument B and so forth. And the, 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 uh, the design here is that if you know, the basic method message sends are fast enough, the extra layer of the bridge method will be reasonable and not cause too much performance degradation. And what about uh, method contexts? Uh, you heard from the Rabinius uh, uh, team how they're doing method contexts. And RVM is a little bit different in that we don't actually have method context objects. Uh, we basically, the machine views each method as having a stack frame. And we take a stack memory, comes from an M-mapped memory region with a guard page at either end that's protected for no access with M-map. So by doing that, we can, we can implement stack overflow with a seg v handler and not have to do any stack overflow checking in the bytecodes. Um, we do have things called variable contexts, which hold the, the, the temporaries, uh, for example, in a method which might be referenced from within a block. They'll, the variable context will also hold copies of method arguments that might be referenced from within a block. Uh, the variable contexts are normal objects living in normal object memory and just normal garbage collection. And they're created and accessed by special bytecodes so that the decision about where the method temp is going to live uh, is done by the bytecode generator. And this design, for example, supports seaside continuations today. And, uh, so we fully expect it'll support Ruby continuations also. Um, how about our object memory? Uh, well, it's, it's also allocated with MMAP. We're not using the C heap. And on Linux and Solaris, there's this flight to MMAP called map no reserved, which means you can allocate, say, 100 megabytes of memory. And the only the parts you actually use will be allocated out of real memory. Um, Apple, uh, Mac OS uh, 10 doesn't yet support this flag, so we wish Apple would support that. It would make things more efficient. Uh, the, uh, gen we have a generation scavenger with a card marking style remembered set. Uh, and the right barrier for that kind of a remembered set is about seven instructions, machine instructions. So, and the right barrier for remember is if you're storing a reference into object A that is going to reference B, and B is not a simple thing like a fixed num, but it's a real object, you have to make sure the garbage collector knows that A might reference a newer object. Um, it turns out this write barrier is very you know, important for performance. Once you get, start to get the bytecodes running fast, then this can become a bottleneck if it's not uh, fast enough. Uh, so we have, if the, Every so often, if uh, the generation scavenger hasn't made enough progress, then we'll run the full compacting mark sweep. And that will use MMAP again to shrink the virtual address space uh, within the overall memory. Our current design has a maximum temporary object memory of about one gigabyte per VM. And this, uh, you know, it's nowhere near as sophisticated a gar as a garb it's not as sophisticated a garbage collector as the Java collectors, but for the you know several hundred object, several hundred megabytes type object memory, it's it's uh, very competitive. So our, in the object memory, we have a three-word object header, um, and this is a 64-bit VM. Uh, it doesn't run 32-bit. Uh, so we have in there in the object header, we have a class pointer, one word worth of size information and format information. And then a pointer possibly to a persistent object table entry, or it, which will be null in a temporary object. Uh, and we directly support variable size objects. Um, so in Smalltalk, there's this thing called become, which lets you swap the identity of two objects. And uh, because we have to support become from our legacy, uh, that means we need to have this notion of forwarders. And it turns out if we have these forwarders, we can easily implement variable size objects. So we've had variable size strings and arrays for a long time in Smalltalk, and we've carried that forward. And the forward, so if you have a string and it has to grow, the original string gets turned into a forwarder. The first uh, 
pointer slot in the body will then point to the larger implementation. And then that gets collapsed by, back to a single larger object by the garbage collector later on. A special object, so Smalltalk has this notion of some classes defining special objects. Uh, for example, uh, Smalltalk's notion of a fixed sum is called small integer. And that, this is one of the things that gets uh, performance in a Smalltalk VM. Um, so a, a fixed num is just one word within a containing object or within a stack frame. And there's no actual load on the garbage collector when you create one. And the way that's done is by tagging the object identifiers. So down here you can see uh, the way we, so the bottom three bits in a 64-bit object identifier or a tag specifying what kind of an object-oriented pointer that is. And I might have that in water there. Uh, so you can have a memory pointer to a, a non-special object, like a pointer to a string. You can have the tag value one says what you have is an object identifier of a disk object. Now that disk object might or might not be in memory, but if you go to fetch that instance variable, the object manager will uh, probe the, the in-memory table of persistent objects. If the object's in memory, it'll give the address back. Otherwise, it'll fault the object in for you on demand. So that's how some of the object faulting works. Or it could be a fixed num. Uh, it could be something we call a small double. Or it could be a true, f true false, or nil. Uh, or an instance of the small talk class called character. These uh, are distinguished further by higher, higher bits within the uh, uh, object identifier. Uh, we talked about variable size objects. Uh, this is, I believe, a fair benefit uh, because it reduces the memory footprint of, of strings. I mean, if you don't have variable sized uh, objects at the lowest level, then a string or an array, each is going to have to have two object headers, probably which in our case would uh, be an extra 24 bytes for that second header. Um, it also makes it easy for us to write C primitives for heavily used string and array methods. So if you're coding inside of our uh, <coughs> subset of C that we use for writing primitives, you can easily grow an object or just store into an object and have it automatically grow for you. Now, how do we do the dynamic instance variables? Uh, so here's a class that, uh, first of all, when we're compiling a class, uh, you know, everything between the first occurrence of the class and the closing end, all of those instance variable references we will assign fixed offsets to. And so that means each of those instance variables will cost one word in the body of an instance. So we've compiled the class uh, so far, and we've created our first instance of it and then stored, uh, invoked this setter method. Then we extend the class with some more methods, which uh, references another instance var we hadn't seen before. This instance variable store will be a dynamic store. And basically, what we're going to do is we're going to grow that variable size object, and for the dyna dynamic instance var, we'll put in a key value pair after the last fixed inst var. So uh, assuming you don't have very many dynamic inst vars in an instance, usually, we'll just do a sequential search for the appropriate key, i.e. the symbol, which is the name of that inst var, on a lookup. And if we don't find the key, then we'll create a new, uh, new pair on a store. If we had an object with a large number of you know, a very large number of dynamic inst vars, we could, we could sort that uh, array of pairs so that we could at least do a, a binary search for finding an inst var. Now, what is a small double? It's a, it's a subclass of float, and this is the way it's going to look in Ruby. Um, and w if you say, uh, if you send name to an instance of small double, we may just return float to you to try and sort of hide the existence of that class. But basically, instances are special objects, and they're a C uh, eight byte float minus three bits of exponent. So 
if you have a numeric operation that would return a float, but the exponent was, is within uh, 10 to the plus or minus 38 roughly, we're going to return a small double and save the overhead of creating a full object. So all of the numeric floating point primitives will deal, can handle interchangeably small doubles and floats. And we're just building off the already existing uh, small talk numeric classes here. Um, so reusing small talk code. Um, we've renamed some classes in Ruby, for example. Uh, and really, other than minor changes to the methods, we don't have to do very much for those. Other classes, we've subclassed off existing small talk classes, which lets us reuse existing code. So for example, hash, we've made a subclass of an already existing small talk uh, key value dictionary class. And we only had to add about two, you know, 250 lines of small talk and 250 lines of Ruby. And I think we have most of hash implemented with that. Um, now, <clears throat> We added something to our Smalltalk VM called message environments. So if you think of a class as having a method dictionary, we changed that method dictionary to be an array of method dictionaries. And the, the environment, no, environment number is an index into that array. So if you're doing a message send from Smalltalk, which is environment zero, you're not going to see any Ruby methods by mistake. Similarly, if we're running in Ruby, we're only going to see what was stored into those environment one method dictionaries. So we're trying to present a pure Ruby view to the Ruby programmer and not have small talk stuff leak into the Ruby environment unexpectedly. So if you ask a Ruby class what methods it implements, you'll only see the Ruby methods. Now, if you think about hash, one of the things it has to do is um, well, I'm jumping ahead. So in order to call from Ruby into the Smalltalk implementation, we have this primitive uh, keyword uh, that we use during our bootstrap process. So in hash, we say primitive, and this means I'm not going to generate bridge methods for it. Uh, there's another variant that does generate bridge methods. Um, and so we say the square bracket uh, store accessor is going to map to the Smalltalk method at put. And since they both, uh, both take two arguments, we don't need any bridge method. Um, so this creates an entry in the environment one method dictionary with the key being square bracket equal. It's actually square bracket equal with two colons after it. And then the value in that method dictionary will be the Smalltalk compiled method. So this particular entry is like a gateway from environment one to zero. Now, once we're in Smalltalk, we're not going to, going to inherit any Ruby methods, but sometimes we need to. So for example, in the, uh, so Ruby hash here is the Smalltalk name for the class hash. Um, the hash function method wants to take a key figure out the hash function for that key, and then do a modulo table size function um, <clears throat> to figure out where to probe the hash table for that instance. And so I need to send the hash method to the object, but have invoke the Ruby implementation of hash, whatever that is. So we added a small talk syntax extension uh, at Ruby colon, which uh, lets us say this particular send of hash will be sent to environment one. And that's how, from within Smalltalk, we call back to Ruby. Um, right now, we're not expecting, uh, you know, customers or application developers to be using this that much. Right now, this is intended for our internal use. But, you know, a sophisticated customer could make use of it if they wanted to. And that, that's the end of the talk. Uh, questions? In terms of, uh, you mean? The, the central stone server where the, uh, right. there must be replication or, well, distribution anyway. Distribution. Uh, 
So is the, the distribution for the in-memory cache, is that a memcache-like model where the well, object has exactly one hole? Uh, so, okay, so let's go back to this slide. Uh, each, uh, the shared memory cache is a shared memory segment on a machine spanning possibly multiple cores uh, or multiple processors even on a, you know, an SMP machine. And any VM on that machine can take advantage of that cache. We can also have another machine, uh, typically on a LAN, uh, that will have its own shared memory cache and that shared memory cache will uh, piggyback on top of the cache that's on the primary server machine. So we can have multiple layers of caches to support bigger than a single machine. So the object read faulting would go, you know, from the disk into the closest cache and then potentially across a LAN connection to another cache. And then each VM has its own private copy of object memory. Well, uh, we do have some distribution product, products in our Smalltalk uh, uh, product. We don't have, I wouldn't say we have a, you know, a good transparent replication design yet for the Ruby product. That probably is still, you know, an exercise for future development. I'd say it, that's something that's on a roadmap, you know. Questions? I guess he answered all of them. Wilson, you've got to have a question. I know there's one there. I was toying with the idea of asking you what your future parser plans were. Ah. Well, uh, obviously we ask away. We, we obviously don't want, an, don't want to run an MRI parse server forever. Uh, although the performance of that is not as bad as you might think. Uh, but um, the uh, one possibility. Uh, is to try running the uh, uh, Ryan Davis's Ruby parser written in parse in, in Ruby. Uh, once we can get our Ruby, uh, <coughs> you know, compatibility up high enough, we, we hope that might be one possible approach. It does not need quite a lot. <laughs> but give, given that given that his 3.0 parser was was kind of just released, we haven't had a lot of time to really look so at it yet. But one we'll, one we'll option is to run that parser um, and then adjust our uh, Piece of our, the part of our code that's taking X expressions in would be adjusted. Um, another possibility is to write a parser in Smalltalk, which would be a lot more work, probably. You you would definitely be able to see that. Um, oh, steal it! I said. Oh, steal it! Yeah. Well, I don't know. Well, you'd yeah, have, you have to ask Monty about the licensing of the Smalltalk. If the parser right. was written in Smalltalk, you'd have to be able to compile that Smalltalk code to whatever bytecode your VM ran okay. to be able to use it. But. <laughs> yes. You said you didn't have replication. What's the fault tolerance for in the hardware? Uh, we can. Uh, let's see. We have. Uh, I believe the customers, well, first of all, we have transaction logs. And so you can, uh, you can have a second system running in what we call warm standby mode, continually reading transaction logs off the primary system. We also have customers that are using operating system level disk replication rate of some sort or another to replicate the disk, uh, you know, replicate the files on disk that we're managing. Basically, you know, rate zero plus one. Um, if one of the disks fails, you yank it out and it recovers. If you take a power hit, so this, the, the disk objects are all transactional with a transaction log. So if the power fails, the system will automatically replay everything up to the last committed transaction when it recovers. Yes. What sort of transaction model do you have if two different processes are playing with the same object? Well, it's a, it's a, it's an isolated view model. It's what we call, so when you, you, there's a begin transaction method and that gets you a stable view of all the objects in the system. And it's basically, uh, you can do explicit object locking if you want to, place a write lock or a read lock on an object. Uh, but by default we're doing what we call optimistic concurrency controls. When you go to the point of trying to commit, we'll analyze changes since you began and if there are no conflicts, 
let you commit and then update your view to current. And then on conflict, you raise an exception? Uh, you get an exception back. You have the opportunity for, uh, we have a small talk code and classes that are called reduced conflicts. You can write collection or dictionary classes that will automatically um, like abort, a sel selectively abort in addition to the dictionary and replay that using the current view. Right, and, and we, we plan to expose some set of those to Ruby, you know, really early on, because obviously you need to have a, you know, some kind of reduced conflict map um, um, to be able to have multiple ac multi-user access to it. So and if you don't yeah. use explicit lock locking, then yes, the reduced conflict is how you deal with the conflicts. I mean, if it's not feasible to replay, then you'd have to abort and just reapply the operation from the beginning. Yes? It may be too early to ask this, but Will the, um, I'm curious about what the proposed mechanisms are going to be for getting data out of the shared persistent storage and into, say, my enterprise data. Or how, how do you bridge that? Will that be similar to the mechanism used by Gemstone S? Well, yeah, I mean, we do have object to relational uh, mapping support in the Smalltalk product. I don't know that we've really uh, Bob, Bob might want to talk yeah, about I can, that. Yeah, I can talk that a little bit. Um, you know, we, we will be supporting active records. So if you're, you know, talking about needing to access, uh, you know, relational data from a Ruby environment, uh, you know, you can certainly use active record to do that. Um, you know, there are a number of scenarios where you might say you want to pull in your your objects from your relational database and forever after, you know, keep them in maglev. Uh, and then there's the other, there's the round trip, where, or, or the, the other way, you know, the direction, where you really do want to stick that stuff out as an extract into a large data warehouse or something like this. Um, and I think either one of those is feasible. The one thing that you really, uh, that kind of surprised me a little bit in, in looking at this some time ago is there is, really isn't an XA protocol in, in Ruby. So, you know, when you get into two-phase commit land, um, there's nothing in the language that I know of to date that would support that. Did that answer your question? Uh, that gave me enough information that I can talk to my people and plan. <laughs> yeah, you definitely. You know, I mean, it's to me, it's it's an absolute requirement that that you know Active Record uh, uh, is supported, or you know other other data mapping technology, you know Data Mapper, um, and you know I would think that the, some of the folks that, that write that code would be interested in um, you, you know talking to us about how, uh, and we are interested in talking with them as well about how it fits into maglev and making sure that they run. I mean, it'll take a little bit of time, but um, you know, absolutely. Like I said earlier, there's a lot of relational data out there, and you know, we understand the need to access it. Well, how are we going to talk? Okay, well, thank you very much for coming.